Amanda Ann Keen. Um, she's been a breath of fresh air in talking about this subject honestly and openly, so it's great to have her here. And then we have Dr. Kiva Hartley, who is a GP and menopause specialist, and she opened the Menopause Health, um, a clinic in Dorky um, earlier this year due to demand. And we have Kiva McCauley, who is Director of Pharmacy for Boots Island. So um, we'll be hearing from everyone. So just, yeah, before we start, just so that you know the hashtag, so hashtag Boots Island and at boots.island, share comments, ask us questions. And as a thank you for joining us today, you'll all be emailed a discount code for selected Boots Menopause products, and you'll get that email after the session. Okay, so we'll go to the first finding from Boots Island's unique research. Um, apparently 30 women of the women, sorry, 30% of the women surveyed don't know what perimenopause is. So can we go to Dr. Kiva Hartley? Um, are you surprised by that number, Dr. Hartley? And um, what is menopause exactly, perimenopause? Yeah, thanks very much. No, I'm, I'm not surprised by that, unfortunately. I think that really is borne out and we see it all the time that women are often baffled because they're bombarded with misinformation. And it's also, it's really confusing. I have to commend Boots. I think it's brilliant that we're doing this. I think it's great to be talking about it. I think it's great to be focusing on education and personal experiences. So it's a, it's brilliant that, that we're all here. Um, menopause really is just the term that we give to our final menstrual period. So it's our last period. But unfortunately, it's a diagnosis that we it, it's done with retrospect. So you don't know that that's your last period until you've gone 12 full months with no bleeding. Then you can look back and think, ah, well, that was my last period. And now I am post menopausal. Yeah. Perimenopause is different. And actually, I think menopause has got quite a bit of attention in the last little while, which is fantastic. But perimenopause is still maybe not quite as talked about. It's clinically very variable from person to person. So it's a really individual experience, I think. Perimenopause is really just the few years that lead up to your final period. And what um, happens usually in that time is that we see your ovarian function, so your ovaries that should be producing these hormones, estrogen and progesterone and testosterone, but in particular estrogen, in a nice sort of up and down pattern in a cycle from month to month. When you get to perimenopause, that starts to become quite erratic and, and it fluctuates a lot and it really changes. Yes. You might not ovulate as regularly and the symptoms we would see are really, as I say, very individual and it can last for anything from, well, how long is a piece of string? A little, you know, but in general, women from around the age of 45 might notice the change. Right. OK. Um, and so going on to the second research finding, um, nearly two thirds of the women surveyed experienced, um, they do experience physical or psychological symptoms. That, has, that significantly affect their day-to-day -day life because of menopause. Um, so Dr. Kiva, again, you know, this, this is a high number, you know, obviously these symptoms can be physical and, and psychological. So do you want to talk a little first about the physical symptoms? Sure, yeah, I think if you look at perimenopause, so this is generally women who are still having periods the first physical symptom they might notice is that their periods have become irregular. That might mean that they're more frequent. It's actually quite common to get two periods in one month, which sounds brutal, but it can happen. And so more frequent bleeding, often really heavy bleeding as well. So a lot of women will notice that their periods are getting much heavier, especially as they go through maybe their mid to late forties. And it can be really, really problematic and really quite distressing, but it can also make you just flat out exhausted. So when you're, you know, bleeding heavily month and month, it wipes you out, not to mention the practicalities of trying to work and, you know, get around and all these things and factor in having to bring spare sanitary products with you or clothes or whatever might be. Yeah. The other physical symptoms in perimenopause that are common would be things like headaches or breast tenderness. Um, and they happen actually because you get uh, times of having over estrogen production, you're actually producing a little bit too much and then being deficient at other times and swinging between those two levels. Mm -hmm. And then I think a lot of people are familiar with things like hot flushes and night sweats. They're generally a bit more common in menopause, but you'd actually might, you might see that happen or creep in uh, for women who are still having periods. And it's it's part of how when they're having little dips in estrogen, they might start having these hot flushes or night sweats. Vaginal symptoms are really common too. So dryness, you know, painful sex, often bladder symptoms like needing to pee frequently, or even some new incontinence can be very common too. Yeah. Okay. And then going on to the psychological effects, because obviously it can have a real impact on your mood and how you feel about things. 
Yeah, a lot of women will describe it almost like PMS, but much worse. So feeling mm. tearful, feeling um, often irritable, even you know, it's a spectrum because it affects everyone differently. But I've definitely had women report feeling almost like rage um, and they're, when they're conscious of it. And it's really distressing because they know mm. it's not my personality, but they've no control over it. And it's often cyclical. I'm OK for a couple of weeks and then I'm dreadful for a week or two and then I'm OK again. And it's wrapped up, I suppose, in the fact that you often are very or sleep or disrupted sleep so that just contributes to feeling ragey and yeah. irritable and having a short fuse yeah. but mood symptoms are common too feeling flat i've just lost my kind of zest my joy my zing for life um and anxiety is really common as well again it's a bit of a spectrum for some women it's just mild and it doesn't really kind of impact their quality of life I have quite commonly heard women report, you know, I, I used to be able to drive from A to B and I'm so anxious now I can't even, you know, can't drive the car. Um, so it can really, you know, I mean, for thankfully lots of women, they get none of these symptoms and they fly through all of this, which is great. Yeah. But there's definitely, you know, other women at the other end of the spectrum and everything in between. Yeah. And often when you get that diagnosis that, that yes, actually you are perimenopausal, you actually can feel better that you, that you know why why you're acting you know why you're it's affecting you like that it's nice um, to be able to have an explanation yeah um, that's really true yeah yeah okay so going on to um more research findings from the boots island survey um they found that 50 percent of the women surveyed have experienced a lack of confidence as they've experienced menopause and another 39 percent of women surveyed said they think that women become less visible as they experience menopause so I'd like to go to Lorraine on this because obviously you've been really honest and talking about your kind of perimenopause journey and, you know, do these findings resonate with you, Lorraine? They absolutely do, Sarah, yeah. And, you know, for me, someone who's spoken openly about my perimenopause journey for the last six years, it really does mirror the feedback that I've had, you know, going around the country with Clean Marine on our talks um, where, all of those symptoms, I mean, there's 34 symptoms of perimenopause and menopause. Thank goodness, none of us get all of them, <laughs> but yeah. we do get um, some, you know, and the one that, that really for me in the last few years um, has surprised me, and I'll probably surprise a lot of people that look at my Instagram or our Facebook, but again, we all know that our social media is putting our best face, never mind foot forward, um, yeah. but it is that kind of anxiety and, and lack of confidence, you know, where your confidence is knocked or dipped in some way. Like I love people, I love socializing. Mm. It's you know part of my job really, um, mm. doing the, the events that I do, live events. And yet I would have found in the last few years, kind of second guessing myself, you know, and doubting myself. Um, and lucky that because I've been on this journey and spoken openly, as I said, for six years, I know that it's just a symptom but lots of women out there don't. I mean, you know, we've had people coming up to, to the panel and literally just bursting into tears when they realize that, you know, oh God, I'm not going crazy or, you know, oh my goodness, I'm not some kind of super bitch that goes into a rage and losing my mind or, you know, all of these kinds of things that we do as, as women and as moms, it's the whole kind of guilt thing, but it's great to actually have events like this, Sarah. So I take my hat off to Boots Ireland and the Glass Magazine for, for highlighting this because I know that knowledge is key and to be able to talk about it um, is just supporting each other, you know? It's yeah. really, really important to discuss it and, uh, and then find out what our options are because there are so many options. You know, you can go down the natural health route, which yeah. is fantastic, it works for lots of women. I'd always say maybe try that first, but there are lots of things that you can change for yourself free lifestyle things like yeah. your diet, your nutrition, your exercise, um, well-being. And then obviously there's also the, the medical route with HRT. So there are lots of options out there. And I suppose it's about just knowing that you do have options. You're not alone. You know, yeah. every single one of us is going to go through it. And, um, and just to share, talk, support each other like we're doing today. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's so right that, that, that people, you know, a lot of us have felt that there's not enough information around to, you know, you don't really know where to start. So, yeah. um, and this was another finding from the survey that Boots Island have done, that 50% um, of the women asked feel like there are gaps of available support for women going through perimenopause or menopause. 
Yeah. So, um, and I'd like to go over to Kiva McCauley, who's superintendent pharmacist at Boots Island, um, just to talk a little bit about the supports that are available for women, you know, at this stage of life. Yeah, thank you. So I think first, like both Kiva and Lorraine have acknowledged it as well. Events like this and conversations that we're having today are hugely helpful in terms of breaking the stigma around menopause, but also helping to empower and educate women to talk about their experiences mm -hmm. and actually to be honest and seek advice because the women are right. There are gaps in the support that is available for us going through menopause, perimenopause, the entire menopause journey. And actually in carrying out the research for this, you know, half a million women in Ireland are, are menopausal age cohort at this point in time and 80% of them will experience symptoms. So actually at Boots as well, we recognize the need for support and something that we have also recently worked on as well as we have worked on learning for our own colleagues and line managers in the field of menopause as well to enable them to have conversations, not just with any patients or customers who are seeking advice, but actually with each other and with our colleagues because we are living longer and we're working longer. And actually we now have a very high demographic of, of women who are of working age whilst also trying to go through that menopause journey. So I think as you said, it's so important that we actually talk about the support that's available. And you know, there is a wide range of support available. So whether that's through products that you can get in store or online, for example, you know, your vitamins like your calcium and your vitamin D, which slow down your bone weakening, um, obviously associated with the lowering levels of estrogen, to actually things like um products for common skin complaints for acne and other skin changes actually that some women see when they're going along their menopause journey and also products to support with genitourinal symptoms such as vaginal dryness as, as uh, Kiva mentioned and then on to other products that simply help support like um, cooling sprays you know for hot flushes mm -hmm. so there is so much actually available out there, but I think it all starts with us having that conversation with each other. And what I would say is, look, we have a, a wide presence around the country. We take pride in actually having that conversation about menopause. Come in, talk to one of our trained uh, pharmacists or one of our healthcare advisors, and let us help you offer some advice and support. And we also recently have launched an information page on our .ie page. And that's really, really good. It contains lots of really helpful information, tells you more about products. So I would say visit there as well. But, you know, yeah. let's get the conversation going. I think that's what we all need to do. Yeah, for sure. And going to Dr. Kiva now um, as well, just on that kind of subject of people going for support. What, what would you say to people about that just as a first step, I suppose? I think talking to people, if you're comfortable talking to, to the people that are closest to you, talk to your family, talk to your friends. If you feel you can do that, not everybody does. And, and a lot of people are very private and they don't want to be sharing this information. But I think, you know, I think we've learned one thing in the last few months, which is that people are often surprised by how they reach out and realize, God, you know, my friend in, you know, wherever it happens to be, that she's going through something very similar. Yeah. And we start to find common ground with our experience going through this process. I think the next step then is to talk to your pharmacist, talk to your GP, talk to people that are, you know, kind of first port of call and get advice from them and work through your own individual set of challenges or symptoms or what's bothering you. I usually start with talking about, you know, the kind of lifestyle interventions and simple things that we can change like diet and nutrition, supplements like, um, as Kiva mentioned, like vitamin D and calcium that are good to protect long term health, which is such an important issue as we lose estrogen. Um, and then, you know, kind of moving from there, if you feel that you need more support, there's loads of resources online. You know, again, as Kiva mentioned, it's great information on the Boots website. There's your GP. And then thankfully, you know, we have other um, this is we, we, people who have an interest in it and specialize in it. And, you know, so there's loads of time we're starting to see more resources and places that people can go to get the right um, information that they need. But um, I guess, you know, there's barriers to even you talk about things like vaginal dryness and, and sexual yeah. health can be very difficult and, and it's often such a private thing it's very hard to share um but you know that's where I suppose health professionals come in sometimes that they can be a good sounding board for for difficulties that you're having in that area yeah yeah absolutely and it and it came through in the survey as well that a lot of women like I think it's four four out of ten four in ten feel like it's not treated seriously enough as well so you know there's there's that kind of holding them back I suppose 
Um, but also just to go to Lorraine as well, just um, to talk about any things that sort of have helped you along the way. Yes, um, as uh, Dr. Kiva was saying, talking really has mm. been hugely important. Um, events like this, obviously the same, but yeah, there are lots of supports out there. Um, I'm lucky that I've I've been in this kind of conversation for for quite a long time, uh, mm -hmm. and you know I have you know sought out the help of of medical professionals and and people that you know have helped me. Lifestyle changes, as both Kivas were saying, are huge, and mm -hmm. um, hugely important. You know where you can actually do things for yourself. Like I started throwing myself into the freezing cold Irish sea, <laughs> sea yeah. swimming. And that has really helped me for some crazy reason yeah. with them, um, with my mental health, never mind my metabolism and the little bit of exercise that I get from my little breaststrokes. I'm not a strong swimmer, <laughs> but just even getting out into the fresh air and um, looking at my diet. There's an amazing little book and it's free and it's called The Essential Guide to Female Hormones. And right. it goes through the five stages of our hormonal journey from puberty all the way through to postmenopause. And there are experts up there in the, the panel giving advice on, you know, well-being, diet, nutrition, exercise, um, and then obviously natural health supplements and HRT. So I would say to anybody who can to pick up a copy of that from pharmacies and health stores, it's also free on a download at cleanmarine.ie and give it to every single girl that you know of every age. My daughters have read it because things are different for them during puberty, during teens, as they would be for somebody in their 20s or 30s, for me, 40s to 50s, and then obviously there's post-menopause as well. So really there, there are amazing um, websites and, and people and network supports out there. So just, yeah, just educate yourself, you know, knowledge is key. Yeah, that's great. It's great, and it's great to have such a positive kind of take on it because so often it's kind of gloom and doom and it's you know it doesn't have to be like that so um, uh, Sarah I'm, I'm looking forward to to actually getting into full menopause and getting out the other side yeah, because yeah. I have so much information I'm like armed and dangerous I'm like bring it on <laughs> because honestly you said it after menopause that's going to be the best time of our lives since puberty. Yeah. We'll have no periods. We'll have no PMS. We'll have no worries of better not wear white trousers to this event. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And, and yes, yeah. we can dive off, skydive off those cliffs like you'd see in the tampon ads. For real. Because <laughs> you don't have periods and you have no period pains. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, that's great. So look, it would be lovely to bring in some questions now. And do keep sending your questions in by the chat box. Um, I think... Right, we've got one here from Ema. Um, after blood tests, my GP told me I was postmenopausal and nothing needed to be done, but I'm still experiencing all the symptoms. What to do? Dr. Kiva, maybe this one? Well, it comes down to the impact that your symptoms are having on your quality of life. You don't have to take anything. You don't have to. Mm. I mean, we should all be aware of long-term health and those interventions are something that we recommend to everyone. So vitamin D and calcium in your diet and weight-bearing exercise, throw yeah. yourself into the sea if you take the fancy to do that. Um, but being active, you know, all those things like and looking after your long-term bone and cardiovascular health are the two things that really kind of stand out when it comes to menopause. They're the two big kind of parts of your components of your health that really change due to this loss of estrogen. So I mean, they don't need to be treated per se, but you should be aware of them and, and kind of modifying lifestyle, I suppose, as appropriate, having your blood pressure checked maybe annually and checking your cholesterol. Um, but in terms of treating symptoms, you don't have to. If you're having symptoms, you're getting the odd night sweat, but you feel fantastic. Well, then mm. great. Like that, and that's a percentage of women, I'm sure, and that's fine. But if you're having symptoms that are impacting your quality of life, well, then it's an assessment of benefit and risk. And so you look at sort of what therapies and options are available, whether it's lifestyle, you know, and kind of conservative, the conservative route or cognitive behavioral therapy or whatever option you want to take, or maybe non-hormonal medications of which there are sort of, you know, several different options there or HRT, which is hormone replacement therapy. But that's a discussion of kind of teasing out what are you trying to achieve? What do you want to treat? what's really bothering you, what would make your quality of life better and balancing that against that person who's sitting in front of you, what's their individual risk of, I mean, if, for example, if it's HRT, what's their individual risk of breast cancer, of blood clots, of other things, and we yeah. factor all of that in. And thankfully now with modern HRT as an example, with modern HRT, we have loads of options that are so much safer than we had previously. 
but it is such an individual assessment. But, you know, mm-hmm. so I think if she's had a blood test that says she's postmenopausal, well, then, you know, if you're symptomatic and it's bothering you and it's distressing you, it's affecting your quality of life. Do something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And someone else asked as well, should I take HRT? Oh, that's a bit, that's, no, a, that's bit a, a big question. <laughs> that's a broad question. Mm. Well, I get asked that a lot. And I think yeah. for some women who are not symptomatic at all, they feel great. They're not having issues. You don't have to take HRT. We don't like, we don't advise it for, even for the, the cardiovascular benefit, which is definitely there. Yeah. You know, if you're completely asymptomatic and doing fantastic, well, no, then maybe HRT is not the right option for you. And there's loads of other, you know, choices um, for making sure that you're set up with good long-term health. Yeah. Um, but there are women who really have a valuable impact on both their long-term health, but also on their quality of life from HRT. But that's yeah. where I suppose the discussion comes into it and the individualization. Absolutely. And should we go to Kiva McCauley on that as well, just in terms of, you know, people still say, is HRT safe? And I know that's a huge subject, but I mean, it would be nice to go to you on that subject. Yeah, I think, um, you know, Kiva probably... I think a lot of the points on the head there around the HRT that we think of now has evolved so much since we would have thought about HRT perhaps in our our grandparents and our predecessors time long before from even the types of HRT that are available to the preparations that are available, you know, whether that's even to treat local symptoms such as, as I said earlier, and Kiva mentioned as well, the Mm -hmm. vaginal symptoms. So, I think in all of these cases, it has to be, as Kiva said, down to individual choice. And I think it has to come down to do the benefits of the particular medication outweigh the risks for you. And I think that is a very, very personalized decision and has to be a good discussion with your GP, because I think it's going to be discussing very specifically what symptoms are you feeling? And actually, could some of those be alleviated or helped with supplements or with healthy lifestyles or with complementary medicines? Or actually, is it something that you feel actually this is now having such an impact on my life? that I feel I really need proper intervention and there is no right or wrong answer. And I think that's the really important thing about this conversation It's about empowering women to look after their own health and to own their own health. Because what is right for me might not be right for Kiva and might not be right for Lorraine because we're all individual, but it's encouraging more of those conversations to allow women to have those options. And then to make sure that actually when women do seek out advice on this topic, they know who to reach out to. They know there are people who can help them and can give them the right advice because sometimes too often as well, there are some pieces of advice out there that maybe don't help women to make the right decision as well. So I I think in summary, very individual choice, big discussion around what it looks like for you and what it means for you. And ultimately at the end of the day, it's it's a choice between you and your GP. Absolutely, that's great. Um, and Lorraine, to go to you, just to ask, someone's asking here, um, how did you first know when you were perimenopausal? I suffered in silence, Sarah, for mm-hmm. a long time because I didn't know. I was one of those people that would see an article in a magazine or newspaper or online. And if it had the word menopause, peri or otherwise attached to it, I'd skip right through because I was like, that's not me yet. (laughs) We'll deal with that when we come to it. Not realizing that I was probably in perimenopause from my late thirties, around 38. Um, So that's really unfortunate. Mostly as Dr. Kiva was saying, it's 40, 45 plus. So five or 10 years before menopause and the symptoms are less and they're milder. But for me, the symptoms were less and they were milder, but I was probably about 38. And the symptoms I had um, were not sleeping. So I had really disruptive sleep. I'd wake in three to five times in a night. Then I'd wake up the next morning and I'd have no energy, obviously. I put it down mm-hmm. to that. Um, I put down the fact that I was waking up all the time because I was busy. I was ju- juggling, you know, small babies and a full time job. And I was, you know, my head was racing all the time with thoughts and things and lists to do the next day. Yeah. And I was also then when I'd wake up with no energy, I'd feel very low. And um, I knew I wasn't depressed. But there were times when I felt really, really low. And the reason why I knew I wasn't depressed was because I know what depression looks like, because I have seen it in in family and um, and close friends. But um, I still felt very, very low. And that's the other thing to say 
that um, there are a lot of women in this country that are being misdiagnosed with depression yeah. um, mm -hmm. when actually they're just in, in perimenopause or menopause. But then I also um, had no libido whatsoever. Again, if you're tired and you're feeling yeah. low and you're feeling irritable, the last thing you're going to feel is amorous. So that yeah. was another thing. And yeah. then I had joint pain. I saw somebody up there actually made a comment about joint pain. And um, I put that down to running, you know, all through my 20s as one of my, my forms of exercise and itchy skin. Now, I've never had a hot flush and I still get my periods regularly and um, they are heavier than normal, but they're still regular. And um, but I do get um, night sweats. And I didn't know that any of those symptoms, Sarah, were just part of perimenopause. God, I sound like a total wreck, didn't I really? <laughs> like, no, how did I even get to this place? <laughs> um, but the reason I got here was I was approached by Clean Marine Menamin to ask me, would I be interested in trying their brand? And yeah. when, I, when they told me it was for perimenopause or menopause, I balked at the idea. I was like, you're mad. I'm not going to go out there and pretend I'm 50 plus when I'm not. <laughs> um, and then when they started going through the symptoms, you know, I started to realize, oh, my goodness, I have that and I have that and I have that one, too. Yeah. So um, so that's why I'm very lucky that I discovered when I did, but but not lucky enough. If I'd known at 38 what I know mm -hmm. now, I wouldn't have gone through years of suffering and, you know, fertility issues and all sorts of other things. And I suppose that's why I felt, Do you know what, you have to come out and share this because, you know, so many women are going through the same thing. And you talk about women supporting women and and um, encouraging each other and being there for each other. So yeah. it's a difficult thing to come out and talk about, but I'm so yeah. glad that I did. No, it's great. Mm. And just, it's interesting talking about sort of night sweats and things like that. Um, there, someone's asked here, um, what about natural options, you know, for hot flushes and night sweats? Are there kind of things you can take that can ease that? Um, Who do you want? So going to Kiva McCauley for that. Mm. Yeah, perfect. Um, so I think, again, what I would say is there are several different options in the complementary space. So I think we'll all have heard about evening primrose oil, black coash, St. John's wort. But what I would say is, even if you go toward the natural route, it is really important to remember that actually some of those complementary medicines do interact with other medicines you're taking and do have certain side effects. So again, have a proper conversation with your pharmacist or your GP if you're thinking about going down the complementary route. There's also other options that you can consider that I mentioned at the start. For example, there's a Meg's menopause cooling spray that we sell and that really helps actually with the hot flushes and the night sweats as well. And then there are other natural things like, you know, considering actually the material of your nightwear, considering the material of your bedwear, um, considering the products and the emollients and so on and so forth that you use to shower. Yeah, great. And um, Dr. Hartley, did you have anything to add on that? I totally agree with Kiva. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's great to look at all those options and and there are plenty of over the counter options that for a lot of women will will absolutely, you know, do the job and make them a lot more comfortable. Yeah. Um, the, you know, I think from a from a research perspective, we know that by far the most effective way of treating night sweats and hot flushes is with estrogen. Um, mm -hmm. So for women who have maybe tried some of those options and it's, it is worth trying them and then maybe, you know, have have symptoms that are are persevering that are continuing and are, and are still impacting on their sleep and their quality of life it is worth a discussion to see you know is there another um maybe prescription option that would be available so yeah. um there are some non-hormonal medications that we use um and they're appropriate for women who either choose not to or cannot take hormones um but for most women you know we know with estrogen the benefits outweigh the risks for the majority yeah. of women and it is probably the most effective way of treating hot flushes and night sweats or what we call vasomotor symptoms of menopause. Okay, great. Um, and just talking, going on about um, HRT, this, this questioner says, I started HRT in July as perimenopausal, I'm 50. I noticed that it seems my breasts have increased in size. Is that normal due to taking progesterone tablets? Yeah, that can be effective both, both estrogen or progestin. So, HRT is really, uh, for most women, it will be a combination of two hormones. So it's a combination of estrogen, which is going to be the 
the part that makes them feel better for the most part. It gets them, you know, on top of those hot flushes and night sweats, it may improve joint aches and pains, it may improve mood, um, and it has lots of other kind of good properties. It's also the bit that really gives you bone protection. Um, so that's the estrogen, that's the kind of foundation of your HRT. And if someone has not had a hysterectomy, if they still have a wound, we have to give them a second hormone called progestin. And that's because estrogen stimulates the growth of the lining inside the womb. So if you're just taking estrogen, you can get an awful lot of bleeding and you may even have a risk of abnormal cells in your womb long-term. So we always give you a second hormone called progestin uh, to protect your womb. But either of these hormones in the initial few weeks after starting um, HRT, they can give you breast tenderness. And it would be common to see some changes in the size of, of your breasts, but really uh, you know, careful about making sure you get remeasured for your bra, which is so hard to do in COVID when you couldn't go in and actually get anyone to measure you and people were at home trying to measure themselves and you're ordering stuff online. But yeah. simple things like that can certainly help. Evening primrose oil is something that's over the counter that's quite safe and that helps with breast tenderness and even taking, you need to take pain relief short term, you could do that. Um, but it's quite a common um, side effect that we would see in the initial few weeks after starting HRT. Right. Okay. There's so many good questions here. I'm kind of I'm trying to choose uh, the best ones, but um, this one: uh, What would Dr. Quiva say to women who may be suffering in silence, and why don't women ask for help? And I think that's an interesting question. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and I'm sure uh, both Keith and Lorraine probably um, could help me out on this one because it's multifactorial, you know, and we're all yeah. individual. And I suppose we come into, you come into puberty, you come into your reproductive life, you come into your, your kind of perimenopausal and menopausal years with your own set of values and experiences that influence how you, you know, see the world and what you feel is the right sort of, you know, way of managing these symptoms for you and as we kind of alluded to earlier often people are really private and they don't want to kind of discuss things that are very personal there's often stigma and shame attached to aging which is enraging in this bloody day and age what like you know yeah. we're so obsessed it's really frustrating um yeah. women are fantastic and we get better as we age i think and yet we yeah. have horrible youth as an obsessed culture um, and so I think there is a kind of stigma and shame attached to it. Yeah. Um, and there's also a bit of grief, like, you know, you're losing re reproductivity, you're losing the ability to reproduce. And that can, yeah. be, that can be a huge psychological um, thing for, for some women as well. So it's, it's a very complicated yeah. thing. You know, yeah, it is. Why I think having discussions like this is kind of normalizing things. It's nice for women, even if they don't feel ready to talk about it, but to see it out there, to see and hear other people talking about it. I, I don't know, do, do Kiva and Irene want to? Yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah, go on, Kiva. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I think um, you've said it, Kiva. The more of these kind of things we do normalize, you know, and, and help to remove the stigma attached to it. So I think the more events like this we can do and, and perhaps make those women who feel less comfortable talking about it a bit more comfortable. The other yeah. thing I would say to anyone who is concerned about having a conversation, when you're speaking to either your pharmacist or your GP, you're speaking to them confidentially. So if you have concerns and questions, you can have that confidential conversation with your healthcare provider. You'll get the advice you need and you can know that that will not be discussed any further because I think as part of that stigma as well, there sometimes is the concern around, you know, I don't want to actually admit this has happened to me or culturally, I'm, you know, a bit nervous about this happening to me. So to know that you have that safe and secure space to have that conversation, I think is really important too. Yeah, absolutely. And how about you, Lorraine, on that? Yeah, I, I think um, it, it would have been seen as a woman's last stage in life, you know, going back a couple of generations because, mm -hmm. you know, we would have, you know, lived to about the age of 60, whereas now we're living to 80, 90, even 100. Mm -hmm. um, I read recently in a newspaper article that 50 is now midlife. So we've got a whole other life to live mm -hmm. um, after menopause so yeah I think it's um it's just it's really important that we know that we're all going through it you know and yeah. um, I found it very difficult to come out and talk about it because the industry that I work in is very ageist towards women and um, so I knew that I was kind of taking a bit of a chance in it myself but actually over the last few years I've realized more and more that um that talking is you know, taking the taboo out of it. And thank goodness for shows like Joe Duffy recently, just before the summer, who didn't just dedicate one week, but three weeks to menopause. Yeah. It was amazing to hear all the women 
come out and, and share their stories. And that is empowering. And as Kiva said earlier, you know, to look after our own health and our hormone health in particular, because our hormones rule, like rule our body. They run everything physically, yeah. mentally and emotionally to take control of that and take care of yourself is empowering. So, um, so yeah, it's just, it's just really, really important that we, we talk and that we share and that we realize that actually we've a lot more living to do and we can be fabulous and God forbid, even sexy at 50 <laughs> plus, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and um, just a sh quick one here on weight gain. Is, is weight gain and difficulties losing weight part of perimenopause? I have improved my nutrition and I have hired a personal trainer, but still finding it hard to lose weight. Um, Kiva McCauley maybe will ask you about that. Yeah, and I can see Lorraine nodding as the question was being asked. So I, I think Lorraine is agreeing with the person who's asked the question. Yeah, unfortunately, um, as Lorraine very nicely said, hormones stream through our bodies. They control everything. They wreak havoc when they're changing. And unfortunately, you can see weight gain um, as part of that. And I think what I would encourage is, I know that the, the lady who's asked the question has said, you know, she has tried, um, you know, looking at her diet. But I, I think that's probably the first place to start. So looking at your diet, looking at your exercise. I know Dr. Kiva had talked about weight bearing exercise for your bone health. But even if it's as simple as trying to get out and walk more, being more active, I think in the first instance, I think if you really are finding that you are absolutely struggling with your weight and you can't seem you know, to either shift that weight or you can see a continual gain, at that point, I think I would be having a conversation with your doctor or with your local pharmacist pharmacist just to understand actually is there anything else at play in the background because sometimes even though the symptom can appear related to the particular condition like perimenopause actually it would be better to have a whole look at is there any other medication you're taking exactly what supplements are you taking is there anything there that may be leading to fluid retention and from there then having a conversation about what the next step would be so Dr Kiva I don't know if there's anything you would add on that I think similar to, you know, the way we talk about, look, it's time to maybe have a different conversation in terms of aging and to remove the stigma of that. I think we actually need to have a very similar conversation about weight and the fact that there is this constant, um, we put a lot of responsibility, I think, on the individual for their own weight. We, there's a lot of shame. There's a lot of blame attached to weight gain when, in fact, you know, we're under from a scientific point of view, we're understanding more and more about the genetics of you know, appetite and why we eat and how we eat and, and weight gain. With menopause, um, true, there's absolutely hormonal changes and they certainly contribute to how we distribute our weight. So you'll often find women for the first time might be finding that they're putting weight across their, their center, across their tummy, which they might not have done previously, or it's more kind of worse across their tummy. And that yeah. can be very um, frustrating because it's a very difficult thing to affect any change and to kind of, to improve that. Um, so I think, you know, although there are hormonal changes that contribute, sometimes the symptoms of menopause, like poor sleep and low mood, they can be drivers of changing how you eat and when you eat and why you eat and what you yeah. eat. Um, I think, you know, telling people um, there's a kind of message out there culturally of just eat, you know, eat less and move more as if it's that simple, when in fact we should be viewing weight gain as really almost a, a chronic disease in its own right it's driven by genetic and hormonal factors like lots of other diseases yeah. and stop sort of you know like encourage people i think to get the right advice and talk to their pharmacist and talk to their gp um and to not sort of internalize weight gain. So I, I totally agree but i think it's it's definitely time to to change how we talk about about weight just like we talk about age differently i hope yeah absolutely no i totally agree and just one last um, note here. Most of the menopause clinics and experts appear to be in Dublin. Where can I find information on clinics and experts around the country? Am I allowed to plug a couple of people? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fabulous. Um, there's there's a, a fantastic um, menopause specialist and she's based in Cork called Dr. Brenda Moore and she's wonderful. Okay. Cassie, Dr. Cassie McVeigh, she's in Sligo in the Vitality Clinic. There's, they're, they're out there. There's, there's you know, I'm, I'm sure um, Kiva and Lorraine know, know of others and I think you know, you've got to you've got to look locally. A lot of GPs have a real interest in this, and through their own GP surgery yeah. practice, are also fantastically placed to give you know very good support and good information. Yeah, perfect. And also, you can go into your local boot store and ask for advice, as we've been talking about. 
Um, and just to mention again, the boots.ie information page, which has gone live today. So that's a very good sort of port of call to find, you know, your products and your advice and things. So um, we're going to wrap up, but just to say thank you so much to our brilliant panellists. It's been really nice to have this chat. I think we could go on for some time sort of going through, but it's a really nice introductory kind of chat anyway. So thanks so much for joining us and thanks to everyone for coming this lunchtime. And just to remind you of the social media handles, um, hashtag Boots Island and tag at boots.island when you're posting about the event. Um, and just to say your discount code for products will be emailed after this session. So um, yeah, thanks so much for joining us. And that's us. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>